After Brexit, it is the next big issue in British politics. The Scottish National Party wants to force a new vote on independence if they can achieve an absolute majority in today's regional election. The question should be resolved for a whole generation, said the Unionists. And let's come back to that. Um, I didn't have the time to put everything together before today, but I just want to mention it again today because I'm, I'm grateful to some commentators under my videos who um, put the quotes there again in context because there's a quote from, from um, Alex Salmon, especially from before the last referendum, where he said it's, one, it's a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity we have to grasp now and use now. Perhaps they will do everything to block another chance for us. So he didn't promise that if we do it now, which I mean 2014, we will never try it again for a whole generation. No, he said it's a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity that we have the chance now. And there's a big difference to what unionists and Brexiteers are turning that quote into. So thank you very much again for those who brought up the whole thing in my comments, which I have managed before today to do so um, with a video because it's complex to do the whole thing and prove it one by one. But if you are interested, have a look in the comments, especially yesterday where people quoted the whole thing. And so it is just another lie that the SMP promised not to do it again before another generation has passed or the whole generation has passed. It is an opportunity in 2014 to do it, but no promise not to do it again. But let's continue. Supporters and opponents of Scotland's independence had announced this before a decision was made on December 18th, 2014. Yeah, that's true. That is an opportunity. 55% of the electorate voted to remain in the UK and 45% to leave the Union with England, Wales and Northern Ireland. But just under seven years later, the subject is back with all its might. One of the reasons for this is Brexit, which the Scots rejected with a large majority in June 2016, but the British accepted that. Or the other British. The heartbreak with the EU that has now taken place has intensified this aversion. In addition, there is the unfortunate action of the government in London in the first phase of the corona pandemic. Obviously, a lot of people have forgotten already. At the same time, the Scottish regional government under First Minister Nicola Sturgeon reached a peak in popularity. She only recently had to accept a damper in the long smouldering affair with her predecessor, Alex Salmond. Paradoxically, Boris Johnson is proving to be Sturgeon's most valuable ally in the struggle for voter favour. The British Prime Minister's unpopularity remains at record levels in Scotland. Sturgeon's Scottish National Party, the SNP, has ruled Edinburgh for 14 years and has never lost sight of its goal of an independent Scotland. For almost two years now, she has been encouraged by opinion polls according to which a constant majority of Scots are in favour of separating from England. Against this background, the result of today's regional election is eagerly awaited. The separatists hope for an absolute majority in the regional parliament. If they succeed, the likelihood increases that the more than 300-year-old union of the two nations on the British Isles could come to an end. So, there is a lot at stake. It uh, therefore seems extremely strange that the political establishment in London has not recognized the danger for a long time. Only slowly is the realization dawning in Westminster that after Brexit, the Scotland question could become the next big issue in British politics. But the government of Prime Minister Boris Johnson has so far acted frighteningly aimlessly. There is no discernible coherent strategy for confronting the Scottish nationalists. This is by no means an easy task. However, much Brexit fueled Scottish separatism. It is only the last of many stages in the weakening of the feeling of togetherness, the so-called Britishness, in the United Kingdom. This process has been going on for a long time because in the face of deindustrialization and decolonization, the Union for Scotland no longer brought the old advantages in the last few decades. In addition, there were the unintended side effects of the devolution, the transfer 
of powers from London to the regional government in Edinburgh, which was promoted by the then Labour government of Tony Blair at the end of the 90s. Instead of digging up the water for the Scottish nationalists, the latter contribu contributed that in Scotland being different was emphasized more and more. The political embodiment of uh, this own Scottish identity is the Scottish National Party. This had fatal consequences for the promoters of the devolution. Support for the formerly dominant Labour Party has collapsed in Scotland, while the SNP established itself as the Scottish version of social democracy. This is also has consequences for British politics. Without the once secure mandates in Scottish constituencies, it will be more and more difficult for Labour to win a majority in the general election in London, because in England, the Conservatives are the majority party with a growing lead, although there was some slums now because of the wallpaper gate. There, meanwhile, another side effect of Scottish separatism is becoming apparent. While in service a majority of the English now consider the independence of Scotland to be inevitable sooner or later, a tendency towards genuinely English nationalism is increasingly becoming noticeable. This is expressed, for example, in the fact that the resistance to subsidizing Scotland, which is perceived as unfair, by the British taxpayer is growing. While many Scots look at London with a similar dislike to the British Brexit supporters at Brussels, it is such numbers that feed the British resentment. Before the Corona crisis, the SNP government in Edinburgh accumulated a budget deficit of 8.6% of the gross domestic product, while the UK public deficit was just 2.5%. And independent Scotland would one day have to fill this gap itself. So there would be a choice between painful cuts in the state budget and tax increases. The question that should actually be asked is therefore less do the Scots want independence, but rather can Scotland afford independence? Such economic constraints were still the trump card of the Union supporters in 2014. But there are many indications that these arguments are no longer relevant today. The SNP does not have convincing answers to many practical problems of independence. But in the current climate of opinion, this has hardly any negative effect on it. The Scottish National Party keeps saying that the nation would be better off on its own than within the union with England. Not only at first glance, this has a lot in common with the arguments of the British Brexit supporters and their absolutization of national sovereignty. Secession from the southern part of the country would mean that a hard border would be established between Scotland and its main trading partner, England, should Scotland join the EU as intended. Nobody wants such a dividing line, but at the moment nobody can say how it will one day be prevented. This example only indicates fragmentarily that negotiating the terms of the divorce with London would hardly be easier than with Brexit. There are other stumbling blocks for Scottish nationalists. On the one hand, after their long reign, the balance sheet does not look brilliant. Deficits in education and health can no longer be hidden. The arrogance of the power of a ruling party, of a ruling party, which pretends that patriotism and its own party interests are identical, is becoming increasingly evident. Many Scots are likely to wonder whether overcoming the consequences of the pandemic should not have absolute priority at this point in time. Should the nationalists fail to achieve the goal of an absolute majority, which I doubt, in the regional elections, this would be a clear setback for the independence movement. However, even with a new strong government mandate in Edinburgh, an independence referendum would only be legally possible if the British government gave its consent, as it was the case in 2014. How would a voter-approved SNP government react if London rejected this request? Formally, this would hardly be contestable, but the political consequences are difficult to cal calculate. Would the nationalists take the path of uh, the Catalan separatists and stage an illegal referendum? Well, so far Nicola Sturgeon has not been open to such intentions 
on the part of the radical wing of her party. And uh, the example of Catalonia is also unlikely to be tempting and completely wrong in the general comparison to Scotland. But there remains a considerable amount of uh, unpredictability. But I just want to say two words about the Catalan thing, because it's being brought up by unionists and Brexiteers all the time. First of all, Catalonia and, and Scotland are two very different things. Cat Scotland joined this union with a treaty on its own accord. Scotland is a nation. It's not a country in the legal sense with complete control um, over its, its own issues, um, but it's a nation. And, as I said, they joined the treaty on their own consent. And uh, there's a big different difference there because of this, this treaty, because as Boris Johnson makes it clear very often, treaties can be dissolved. If you don't like it, get out of it. Um, they did that with the European Union, by the way. They joined the Un European Union by treaty as well. And on the other hand, um, there is still a legal path via the courts if they go for the part that uh, Scotland joined the Union on its own accord with the treaty. And so we have the right to decide if we get out of this treaty. That is one uh, possible way to go. So I see no illegal referendum, but I see the possibilities of uh, going to the courts. I see the possibilities that without a written constitution for, for Great Britain, it's it's quite difficult and even harder to determine. But it could still be legal for for um, the Scottish Assembly to, to, to hold a non-binding referendum, and then the Assembly decides on... Uh, to follow that referendum, by the way, just the way um, the House of Commons did, because the Brexit referendum was a non-binding referendum. It, it w Legally, it had no consequences at all. Parliament decided to trigger Article 50, not the referendum. And so there are many legal details um, they have to go through. So I w wouldn't say it that generally, as German newspapers, for example, do, that it is un illegal to hold a referendum against the will of, of Westminster. So we will have to see about that. And um, I'm not, in general, a friend of the SNP because they are too social democratic for my um, taste. But I'm absolutely a friend of the Scottish people having their say. And having their say again with a completely change of the circumstances what we have now and that i do you can see so there's much more detail behind this than than a lot of people want to see boris johnson for his part has to recognize that he as prime minister he would have failed in an epoch-making way if scotland were to split off during his term in office he must also realize that economic arguments alone will not be enough to preserve the Union. At Brexit, he showed how you can successfully suppress such issues and still win votes and elections. The Scottish National Party's claim to be the exclusive representative of a Scottish identity should therefore be countered by Johnson's Tories above all with a well-founded criticism of the SNP's record as a long-standing ruling party which in this respect offers quite a few open spaces for attack. But logical attacks is not current Tories' way. The secession of Scotland is not yet inevitable. It would leave both parts of the country damaged, like with the Brexit. Convincing arguments against a rift in the United Kingdom appealing to both the head and the heart are therefore necessary. Maintaining the union of the two nations on the British Isles would be well worth such an effort, say many people. I don't see that anymore because all the arguments the Brexiteers used for Brexit and the more and more poisoned atmosphere makes it for me, from, from my outside point of view, very unlikely. But we will have to see. I'm looking forward for the results of the regional elections and the elections in London 
we will get tomorrow at latest, I guess. Um, really excited. And if you want to stay informed, please subscribe to my channel. Auf Wiedersehen.